Hey there, camels. Uh, today, I want to continue our exploration around locals. This is this video is part of a series of videos about uh, about the local mode that um, that my Jane Street colleagues and I have been adding to the OCaml compiler. We're working in a branch of the compiler, working toward upstreaming this as part of the general OCaml. In the meantime, everything that we're doing is available via the, our open source branch. Uh, there's a link available in the description below the video. Um, today, I want to continue sort of looking at this program that we started at last time where um, where we had a program that by using some local annotations we were able to really reduce the amount of garbage collected allocations as as our as our program ran and so today i want to explore how that actually works and so we can see where the memory is going and how it all works under the hood to, to sort of follow along with this video, you're going to want to have the code from that uh, available to you. There's a link down in the description, um, but there's just not quite enough room in this video to have both the drawings that, that I'm going to do here and the code that you're going to need to look at. So you may want to just have that in a separate window. Okay, let's dive in. The, the main part of that program is the do it function. So I'm going to make over here our call stack. And our call stack, the big function, is going to be do it. And do it has two interesting local variables. So we're going to have our iteration variable i here, and then there's going to be our list variable. Now, list to to generate the list, we call this init function. So that's going to be the separate stack frame here, init. And uh, let's see, the details of init aren't really all that important to us. But what this init is going to do, well, actually, before we dive in and seeing how it works with locals, let's look at what it happens. What happens normally. Uh, so, if we, so now we're going to pretend that there's no locals anywhere, and this is just how sort of a normal OCaml program would behave if it was written, if the, well, the program that we're, that we're looking at. Okay, so uh, here this init is going to go over here, and it's going to start allocating lots and lots of memory on the heap. Uh, so let's see, so this is going to create a bunch of consoles. It actually works backwards because that's the efficient way to make lists. So maybe we have an 8 here, and then we have another console with a 7 in it. And then we have maybe another console with a five in it. Okay. Um, and so, and then when this is all done, let's say we only have three cells, we're going to end up with a pointer uh, from this list variable to the beginning of my, of my list. And then the do it function does a little bit of processing to figure out how many multiples of five there are on the list. Okay, so let's say that's all done. Then we're gonna go on to the next iteration. So this three becomes a four. And then now, oh, I, I should have erased this a moment ago, right? The init, fin the init function finishes. Uh, but now at iteration four, we're going to call init again, and it's gonna go through and it's gonna make a bunch more consoles. So here we're gonna have, I don't know, maybe now we're up to 42. And then here we may have 36, and that'll point there. And then maybe we have another 15, just we have something that's multiple of five there. And now, when this is all done, we're gonna, this, this pointer to here, that's done with. And instead, now list is gonna point up there. Now, I said earlier that this is all gonna be garbage collected memory. So all of this stuff gets allocated. And then at this point, say, um, we, uh, we are about to run out of memory. And so before running out of memory, the, uh, the runtime of OCaml is gonna go through and figure out what memory we can reclaim. So to do that, it's going to go through and it looks for all of the variables here. So we first look here to find any variable in our call stack that might refer to the heap. So it finds this list variable. And then the list variable um, is going to go over and, and it's going to start traversing. And then it finds this. So this is a good variable. And then this memory is used, and this memory is used, and this memory is used. But that's it. This memory over here, uh, well, it turned out that there was no way to get there from the stack. And so if there's no way to get there from the stack, then we can go and we can reclaim all of that memory. And so all of this gets garbage collected. Garbage. And so that gets garbage collected. And then now we have more memory to, to allocate with in our program. And that's, that's basically how garbage collection works. There are problems, though, with this approach. So, so first off, let me just say, garbage, collect garbage collection is a wonderful thing. Garbage collection is what has allowed us to develop out immutable first functional programming, gives us better reasoning properties about our programs, allows us to build software faster. 
yet it is not perfect. Nothing is perfect. The problem with our automatic garbage collection is, well, as I described here, there's this sort of complicated algorithm that we have to go through to identify what isn't garbage so that we can then remove what is garbage. During the processing of all that, that's called mark and sweep garbage collection, while we're doing that, everything in our program has to stop. So this, this program that we're looking at is only single threaded, but we can imagine in a multi-threaded program, not only do we have to stop our one thread, well, all of these different threads actually share a heap. So all of them have to stop so we can do this. So that's not so good. And while we're looking, well, now the data that we're looking at, that's data stored off in memory. This means that to be able to access it, we have to look through memory. When we look at memory and we look at that same memory over and over again, the modern processors cache that um, so that that way accessing it is faster. But now all of a sudden we have to go off and maybe look at memory that isn't as important as we're doing all of this marking and sweeping. All of this is really not so good. And so, and this slows down our programs. Again, even at Jane Street, almost all of our programs are just fine with doing all of this garbage collection. It's a really good technique. However, there are some cases where we want to act quickly. Um, and so in those cases where we want to act quickly and we really don't want to have any latency or other slowdowns, we don't want all of this stuff to happen. And that is what's fueled our investigation of these locals. Okay, so now I'm going to move on so that, that was what ha that's what happens in a sort of a normal OCaml program uh, where we have to do this mark and sweep and then garbage collection. Um, so instead, let's clear the slate here and instead, um, uh, we, let's see what happens with locals. So once again, we have our call stack over here. This is unchanged and we're going to have do it again. And in here, we still have i equals three. And then we're going to try to initialize list. So we're going to have, we have this room for list and then we're going to call our init function. But this, when it's, whoops, when it's all uh, keyed up for locals, instead of allocating on the heap, it's going to allocate over here on something I'm calling the local stack. Um, and here on the local stack, this is a different area of memory. It is not the call stack. It is not the heap. It is something else. So in this local stack, once again, we're not going to look at the details in init, but init is going to allocate its first con cell, which might be this, and then it's going to allocate another con cell, which might be this, and then it's going to, ooh, what happened to my L? I must have accidentally hit some undo button. Um, then we're going to have maybe one more con cell that, ah, dear, that looks like this, and this list is going to point to it. Everything here works just fine. The init function at this point is done. Um, and, and then my do it function can go through and find all the multiples of five. Great. Um, but now we want to go on to the next iteration. We're about to increment that three to a four. And that means we go around the loop. As we've talked about in the past, when we go around a loop, or rather the body of a loop, is a region. And we say that local value, values don't escape their region. And so if we're ending a region, that means that all of the locals that have been allocated since the beginning of the region, all of that memory, we must be done with. Let me repeat that. That's the key point here. When we end a region, all the local variables, all the local values that were allocated since the beginning of the region, they can't escape the region. So therefore, we know we are done with them. So as we go around the loop, as this three becomes a four, without any further work, we can get rid of all that stuff. That stuff can be deallocated. And then the next time uh, when, when, we, uh, when we do call init again, then we're going we're gonna to start reusing that same memory over here for, what was it, 42 and 36. And I'm drawing it. I mean, I've moved a little bit on the page, but the idea is that this is using the exact same memory as we did before um, because we've just reclaimed it. And it's by doing that locals analysis, by knowing that the locals haven't escaped their region, um, that, that we know that doing this is safe. And, and actually, this deallocation, it, it, it's much quicker in, in, in a computer than it was for me scribbling on this. All it has to do is just change one value in memory to say where to do the next allocation. It's very, very fast. No marking, no sweeping, no cache invalidation, um, no latency. Um, so 
that's that's one of the really that, that is in fact the big advantage that we're getting from local it maybe also gives us some nice safety properties as we saw in some previous videos but this here is really what what it, what it's about and one one key point that I, that I just want to return to here is that the local stack is separate from the call stack and and the reason that that's important is you might remember a, a few moments ago that init finished before we did the analysis Right, so that means if we allocated all of these consoles somehow in a NITS um, uh, stack frame, that really wouldn't work out. We need these values when they're when they're written inside of an exclave in particular. We need these values to be able to survive across function returns, um, but we we don't need them to survive across regions. And so there's a slight mismatch here between functions and regions that's mediated by exclave, and it also means that we need to store the locals separately from the call stack, as I've drawn here in this diagram. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting for you. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.